You can see on the screen there, the title of the message is One Way to God, or another way that I can title this message is Stop Worrying Because God is in Control. Uh, that would be more applicable for where we are in our life today, in our world today. Stop worrying because God is in control. I want you to think about worry. I want you to think about the aspect of it gripping every single one of us. For instance, sitting here in this room today, there are some people who worry more than others. If, you're, if I brought up the word worry, you would say, yes, that totally fits me. Because there's concern about your circumstances, uh, whether they're in the past, the present, or the future. And many times they deal with things like your work, your finances, your circumstances, or maybe even your health. But here's something that we need to remember about worry. And it's very critical because worry can get in the way of worship. Let me say that one more time. If we are not careful about worry, worry can get in the middle of worship. Here's what I mean by that. We as Christians, we as believers, are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And when we have been redeemed, everything that we do becomes an act of worship. Whether I'm serving you know, at, at work or if I'm uh, ministering to my neighbor across the street, whatever the circumstances might be, as a believer, everything that I'm doing, I'm doing for the glory of God. So it is an act of worship. But when I sit there and worry about my circumstances, what it does, it, it robs me from being someone who worships God, who obeys God, and it totally shackles me, it puts me in bondage, living the life that God has called me to live. In John chapter 14, this is the exact circumstance that Jesus and his disciples end up finding themselves in. Uh, in the past couple weeks, you've read about uh, and you've studied with uh, Nick and Stephen about the disciples and Jesus being with them the final hours before he goes to the cross and their hearts are burdened. They're wondering what is going to happen because this man, Jesus, who we have been with, who has given us purpose and meaning and shown us the way to God, he is saying that he's going to separate from us and their hearts are naturally worried. So if you are sitting in this room today and maybe you are a chronic worrier, right? Uh, some of you are like looking at your spouse saying, yep, that's you, you need to pay attention. Um, or you might be someone that has something on the horizon, you don't know how to handle it. This message is for you. Because we're going to put worry in its proper context and perspective, and we're not going to allow worry to rob us of worship in our life. So let's look at John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, and let us look at Jesus' answer for troubled souls. But what I find interesting as we go into John chapter 14 is the whole time it should be Jesus that is troubled. It is Jesus that should be worried. It should be his disciples that are ministering to Jesus because he is going to go and face the cross. But what we see in John chapter 13 is Jesus goes and washes his disciples' feet and shows an act of what he's going to do through the cross. He serves them. He loves them. He is patient with them. And so Jesus, you have to understand this, in the middle of understanding that he's about to go face the cross, he's going to be executed on the cross, he's going to be abandoned, he's going to have the Father turn back on him, Jesus utters these powerful words in the first six verses of John chapter 14 that are applicable for every single one of us. And look at how Jesus begins verse 1. With a simple phrase, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. I mean, we can stop there and look at it and break this passage down like we're going to, but just those words should touch our souls because Jesus is telling us, let not your heart be troubled. What were the disciples worried about? What were they so concerned about that Jesus would say these words to them because they were troubled by Jesus' words earlier in John chapter 13? Look at what he tells them in John chapter 13. He says, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. Now you've got to think about the disciples being with Jesus. They have left their professions, they have left everything, and they have decided to follow Jesus. Because here is a man that has given them value and worth. He has taught them about God. He has confronted the Pharisees. He's taught them what true religion is. And here they are learning from Jesus. Here is their rabbi. Here is their master. And all of a sudden he says to them, I have to leave you. I mean, if you were the disciples, you would have a lot of questions. Well, what do you mean? 
You've been here with us. You're telling us the way to God. You're telling us how to be right with God. What, are you, what do you mean when you say that you have to leave us right away? And it's interesting, that first phrase, Jesus uses the word trouble. The word trouble literally means to shake up or to stir up. And many of you might be thinking, no, this is not the origin of James Bond, okay? When he uses that famous line, okay? If you're paying attention, you know what I'm talking about, okay? Um, the word trouble means to shake up or to stir up. It figuratively, it means mental and spiritual anguish. So you get a little bit better picture of what his disciples are going through. They are concerned, not just in their minds, but also in their bodies. And they're concerned in their spirit. What are they going to do when Jesus says that he is going to leave them? I want you to think about this first phrase. I want you to look at the word trouble. And I want you to think about your own personal life. Because every single one of us has had those sleepless nights, right? Where your body is just absolutely fatigued, but your mind is racing. And as you're sitting up in your bed, you're asking yourself these questions. You say things like this to yourself. You say, what if this doesn't fill in the blanks? Or you say, if I lose my job, then this fill in the blank. And in the middle of such thoughts, we turn away from God, who is fully in control, and who has our best intention at heart, and we begin to focus on our troubles. Every single one of us has been there. If you haven't been there, you will be there. And that's what I'm trying to tell you, is that worry in your life will turn you away from God, and it will turn you only to worry itself, and it will bog you down, it will shackle you down, and you will lose the idea of what true worship is. We have to put it in its proper context and perspective. For instance, Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't have spiritual anguish, mental anguish. And in that first phrase, he says, let not. Look at the word not there. It literally means stop being troubled or set your hearts at ease. You know what Jesus is basically saying? Jesus is saying, stop it. He says, stop it. Before you have a negative thought or if you start worrying, stop it. Stop it right now. Stop it with the mental anguish and the spiritual anguish. Because he's going to tie in not worrying to who he is. See, that's very important for us to understand. We simply as Christians don't say, stop worrying, everything will be okay. We say things like, stop worrying because God is in control. That's the purpose of the passage. And Jesus is saying, let not your heart be troubled. Literally saying, cease from doing this. Have you ever told your kids to stop it? Anyone here? <laughs> that goes over really well, right? Now, you, you would not believe how many times we use the word stop it at our house. I mean, just it's just constant. And I don't know what it is if you have ever gotten up to preach or teach or whatever it is. You know, some of the guys that have pastored here know what I'm talking about. But why is it that Satan always shows up at Sunday morning, Right? The rest of the week, you know, whatever, yeah, there's kicking and screaming, but man, there is craziness on Sunday morning. You say, stop it so many times. But I want you to think about something. When you tell your children, stop it, do you mean that you want them to think about it a little bit and come back to you? Right? When you tell your kids, stop doing that, are you saying, well, I want you to have the option of thinking about it, and tell me what your thoughts are on that, and then you come back to me and let me know if you want to stop it. Right? No, you don't do that. You give your children a direct command or else they die, right? That's what you want to tell them. <laughs> Seriously, that's, that's what you do. Here is a command that Jesus is giving to us. Jesus is saying, in the midst of worry, in the midst of knowing that I'm going to be going away, I want you to put your hearts at ease. Stop being troubled. Folks, can I ask you a question? When you sit and worry, can you really change anything? Think about it. Ask yourself this question. You stay up at night, you're thinking through all the 100 scenarios that could possibly happen, and when you confront the situation, none of it happened. And so you've wasted your whole night, you've wasted your week, you've wasted your month or your year concentrating on worry. None of us can change the circumstances of the future. We can only trust in the God of the future. That is what the Bible offers to us. William Barclay says this in a quote. He says this, there comes a time... When we have to believe where we cannot prove, and to accept where we cannot understand. If, in the darkest hour, we believe that somehow there is a purpose in life, and that that purpose is love, even the unbearable becomes bearable, 
And even in the darkness, there is a glimmer of light. Jesus was going, is going to offer them himself. Look at the next phrase that he ties it in with. He says, let not your heart be troubled. He, then he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Now, if, if someone comes to you and they tell you that your heart, your heart is really troubled, their heart is really troubled, and you want to offer them some type of uh, com uh, comfort or so on and so forth, you don't say like, well, I'm going to offer you this comfort, right? You don't really say that. You say, you know, let, let's pray about it, you know, let's, let's talk it through, why don't you go back and read your Bible. You see what Jesus is doing here, he's offering himself. Their hearts are troubled, and then his automatic response is, you believe in God, believe also in me. The phrase believe in, it means to put confidence in, rely on for support, and for consolation. Jesus was telling them, continue trusting in me. Here is something that we miss out on when we are walking in our Christian journey, and here it is. Sometimes when there is silence from God, we, we equate that with rejection, right? When we're praying to God and we're waiting for Him to answer our prayers and nothing has happened and we keep seeking and keep seeking and all of a sudden God is silent and we think to ourselves, God has rejected me. Folks, can I tell you that our faith is not dependent on whether or not our prayer requests get answered here and there. Our faith has to do with the object of our worship and the object of our worship is Jesus Christ Himself. Can we trust in the character of God? Can we trust in what He has done for us in the cross? If I can trust in Jesus for forgiving me of my sins and providing me eternal salvation so that I don't have to fear anything, I can hold on to that silence and keep trusting in God. The disciples were worried and Jesus says to them, but you believe in God, believe also in me. This is almost like what I believe Jesus is saying. He's saying, I know you are tempted to completely focus on your circumstances, but keep having your foundation and your faith and your assurance in me. Be constant in your walk with God. See, there's many different types of worshipers in this room. And you may say, well, Dave, what exactly do you mean by that? There are some people that are all about the mountaintop experience. You know, they say, I want more of God. I want more of God. And, you know, I want to know what that mountaintop experience is like. And that's all they live for. And they say, this is the only time that I can learn anything about God. But do you realize most of what you learn about God happens in the valley? We don't want to hear that. You know, because in our culture, on TV and on many Christian radio, we've been indoctrinated with the fact that if you are on the mountaintop experience, that's when you're going to learn more about God that is incorrect. It is in the valleys that I learned about who I am. That I'm messed up, that I'm fragile, I'm a sinner in need of God's grace. And it's only by relying on God that I can fully keep growing in my walk with Him. Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me. Here's something else that I find amazing. Is how often people first turn nowadays to first Facebook instead of getting themselves in the book. You know what I mean by that? There's some people that are so addicted to social media and trying to go all these different venues to vent out their problems, and God is saying this, Hello? Hello, it's collecting dust. You know, this is the way, the truth, and the life. This is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of God. Why aren't you going in here? Look, let's be honest. Every single one of us loves a pity party, right? We, we really do, but is that the solution that we really want. We, we like for people to feel sorry for us and feel bad for us, and that's why we get on and tell everybody what our problems are. But I want you to think about something. As a believer, and, and I know especially for me, I don't want people constantly patting me on the back and telling me that they feel sorry for me, right? What I want people to say is, man, look, you are going through all of these circumstances but you have the life of Christ in you that is empowering you to be victorious daily. That, that is the life I desire. That is what I want for you. That is, that is what I want for us. And that is what we need to do is say, God, I know that even in the most difficult of circumstances, my faith and foundation is not on everything else around me. It is going to be founded on who you are and what you have done for me. Look at this two quotes, one by Adam Clark and Matthew Henry. Adam Clark says this, It is best to read both the verbs in the imperative mood. Here's what he's saying. 
Place your confidence in God and in me as the mediator between God and man and expect the utmost support from God, but expect it all through me. Matthew Henry says this, he says, Be not cast down in disquiet, and let your heart be kept with full trust in God. However others are overwhelmed with the sorrows of this present time, be not you so. Christ's disciples, more than others, should keep their minds quiet when everything else is unquiet. Here's the remedy against the, this, this trouble of mind. Believe. By believing in Christ as the mediator between God and man, we gain comfort. I love Matthew, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 4. Arguably one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, among many others, but this would top the list. But Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 says this. It says, See then that we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Bible's answer for difficult times is to tap into the power. It is to tap into the source who our mediator, Jesus Christ. Folks, can I tell you something? That the throne room of heaven is always open, it is always accessible. It is always there for you. God has made the way for you. The, the veil has been torn as we just sang about. We have full access to God through the person and work of Jesus Christ. The problem isn't a lack of access, but rather a lack of persistence on our part. Can I ask you a question? If you were to view your walk with God for the last two years, three years, four years, five years, ask yourself this question, have you grown in your walk with God? <coughs> Do you know more about God? Do you know more about His Word? Have, have you grown through the circumstances? Folks, there's all these things that we can do, but at the end of the day, we have to realize that growth is between us and God. And so the problem isn't a lack of access, the problem is a lack of persistence on our part. Do we really want to be more Christ-like? Do we really want to grow in our walk with God? Do we really want to know more about Him in His Word? The problem is no one is stopping you. God has it there for you. The, the issue is, am I going to make time to grow in my walk with God? When you look at Hebrews chapter 4, when you look at the fact that we have Jesus as our mediator, as our high priest, who understands what temptation is, and what weaknesses are, what struggles are, and that He is there constantly as our mediator, it would be Jesus Christ, the one who has redeemed us, and that's where we can find our hope. So Jesus tells His disciples, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Look at, look at the source. Look at the foundation. If your foundation is secure, your heart should not be troubled. <clears throat> look at verse 2. It says this, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. The word Father's house, it is a reference to heaven. Now look at the word mansions there. In the original Greek language, it refers to dwelling places. So here's what it is. This does not mean that every person will receive their own mansion, okay? Now, it would be nice, right? But here, here's what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you. I'm okay with the shack in heaven, okay? You can have the nice rooms, okay? You can have the nice decor. I'm totally okay with the shack. I'm okay with assisting Peter opening the doors of heaven, okay? The, the glory of heaven is not that we get a mansion. The glory is that we even find ourselves there. Because we are only there, not because of our own merit, because of our good works. It is everything to do with the grace of God. And when you wake up one day and find yourself there, standing face to face with Jesus Christ, it's because of what He did for you on the cross 2,000 years ago. Be tempt, don't be tempted to take too much credit for yourself. 
For what we get and what we invest, there is no comparison. To have heaven be our final destination. Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Notice the solution. Jesus, what he is offering, isn't a physical solution. He is saying that in the midst of earthly struggles, Jesus wants to offer you a heavenly perspective. <clears throat> I, I don't just have this up here on my notes, but if you have your Bibles, real quickly, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, because there are some great verses that I want to point out to you there as well. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. I just want to read this and parallel this with what we are looking at this, this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, Peter says this, this is, these are a group of people that are persecuted in Asia Minor. Uh, they're struggling in their walk with God. But yet Peter assures them and says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. See, when Peter is talking to them and he's saying, look guys, I know that you're persecuted, I know that you have struggles, I know that you have trials, but keep looking towards heaven because your deliverance is going to come one day. And that is the same thing that Jesus is telling his disciples. That is the same thing that Peter would tell us today. Keep looking towards heaven. That is the perspective. That is the solution. So, so I want you to think about something. The solution isn't necessarily deliverance from trials. Let me say that one more time. The solution isn't necessarily deliverance from trials... It is the strengthening of one's faith in the midst of trials. Hey, where does God grow you the most? Is it on the mountaintop experience when life is just dandy and great? Right? Chances are that when times are good for you, that you kind of ignore God. Be honest. You know, your prayer life is lacking a little bit. You're not reading your Bible as much because everything is just fine and dandy. But it is when we find ourselves in trials, we cry out to God, God, where are you? I'm your servant. I'm your child, how can you forsake me? But the purpose of trials is to strengthen us in our faith. Now I mentioned to you earlier that this does not mean that every person will receive their own mansion. Rather it means that there will be rooms in the Father's house for us to reside. And some of you are looking around like, man, I do not want to share a house with that person in this room, okay? I think they can just be frustrated. You're going to have new bodies, okay? We're going to be perfect in heaven, don't worry, Okay? Um, John, Dr. John MacArthur says this, the picture is rather of a father building additional rooms onto his house for his sons and their families as was often done in Israel. In Bible study we're going to look at this concept and the cultural aspects behind what Jesus is saying and I think you will find it quite interesting. Another quote says this, it says, but it may well be that the meaning is very simple and very lovely. There are many abiding places in my father's house may simply mean that in heaven there is room for all. An earthly house becomes overcrowded, an earthly inn must sometimes turn away the weary traveler because his accommodation is exhausted. It is not so with our Father's house, for heaven is as wide as the heart of God, and there is room for all. Jesus is saying to his friends, don't be afraid. Men may shut their doors upon you, but in heaven you will never be shut out. Well, what a promise, what an encouragement to those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying, if your heart is troubled, stop looking at your earthly circumstances, stop being worried about the things that are here on earth, have a heavenly focus. Verse 3, Jesus says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now the disciples are scared, they're terrified where Jesus is going, and he comforts their hearts. He says, guys, it's going to be only for a little while. It's only going to be just for a little bit. Then I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, and guess what? I'm going to come back, and I'm going to take you back to that place. Well, what an incredible 
promise. Jesus is referencing the fact that he will take believers, their church, to heaven. He's going to take us out of this place. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Paul says this, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. This is a reference to dying, not literally just sleeping, but those who have died. It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Folks, I don't know how you can just read that passage and not have excitement in your soul. That this earth is not the end. This life is not the end. It is for those who don't believe in God, who indulge all of their passions on the things of this world. But we have something better to look forward to. There is hope. One day the Lord is going to come back and take us home to be with Him. And guess what? You are going to leave all your stuff behind. Some of you are like, man... I worked all that overtime so I could have that thing. What do you mean I can't take it home with me? Nope. It's going to be outdated in heaven because everything is new. You're not going to be able to take it with you. And that is what we sit and worry about, folks. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Everything that we're working for, everything that we're exhausting ourselves with, is of the physical and earthly nature, and we're sitting there stretching out. Uh, we're ruining, ruining our families. We're having arguments. We're not able to worship, and we can't take it to heaven with us. Is it worth the sacrifice? Jesus is worth the sacrifice, but not all of these physical things. Uh, I want you to think about another perspective here. Let's just say, for instance, you've just been sitting, worrying, trouble on your mind. You've been struggling, and, the, and this battle has gone on for a week, a month, maybe a year. And then out of nowhere, boom, you're out of here. You're going to get to heaven, you're going to look back and say, man, I wasted that year. I could have been busy serving the Lord. I could have been busy sharing the gospel with someone. And when we get to heaven, we'll look back and say, man, I wasted so much time on things that just weren't important. I think about Jesus' words where he says, I go and prepare a place for you. I'll come again, receive to myself that where I am. There you may be also. I thought about this as well. It is true that in the Bible, we see heaven as only as a future fulfillment. And we do. One day, right? We say, one day I'm going to make it to heaven. That's what we say. But you realize that the question that I can ask you is this. Do I see heaven only as a future fulfillment, or can I experience some of the future joy in the present? We, we say things like this. One day I'll experience true joy. One day I'll get to be in heaven. One day I'll experience the presence of my Savior. And God is saying, well, why exactly can't you be doing that right now? Why can't you experience a little bit of heaven on earth right now when a soul turns to the Lord Jesus Christ? Why can't you have joy in your heart right now? Why can't you be worshiping right now? Folks, everything that we are doing right now here on this earth should be practiced for one day when we stand before the throne room of heaven. Because I can tell you, when you are standing before the throne room of heaven and worshiping God, you're not going to be allowed to be like this and silent, right? Because you're going to see the awe and majesty of God. You're going to see the splendor of heaven. You're going to see people from every tribe, tongue, and nation who are worshiping before the throne room of heaven. You are going to be awed. You are going to fall on your feet and worship God like you've never worshiped before. Everything I do on this earth right now as a believer should be practiced for what I will be doing one day before the throne room of heaven. That should change my perspective on how I live. Verse 4, it says, And where I go you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. 
And how can we know the way? Now, Jesus had already indicated to his disciples that he was returning to his Father. You, you can understand if there's anyone that should have been frustrated by the lack of understanding. It should have been Jesus, but you find him very patient. You find him very kind. You find him very loving. For instance, John 7, 33, Jesus had already told them, seven chapters back, that Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. That they should have understood, they should have known. And many times we become very judgmental of Jesus' disciples, but think about it, some of you, and myself included, we ask the same questions. Well, what do you mean, God? Well, what, what, what do you mean? What do you mean you want me to do this and not do this? And we have this lack of understanding. It is the same thing that we find with his disciples. There's two great quotes here by Charles Spurgeon. First one says this. The apostles blundered and lost themselves in the words of their master. Instead of entering into the spirit of what he said. So we must not wonder if we often do the same. Unless we wait upon God to be instructed by His Spirit, even the plainest passages of Scripture may be obscure to us. In the second quote, Charles Spurgeon says this, Thus we notice how they speak to Him with a natural, easy familiarity, and He talks to them in full sympathy with their weakness, teaching them little by little as they are able to learn. They ask just such questions as a boy might ask of his father, Often they show their ignorance, but never do they seem timid in His presence or ashamed to let them see how shallow and hard of understanding they are. Do you, do you see the patience that Jesus has with His disciples? Jesus has patience with His children. How many of you lack patience? Raise your hand. Be honest. Just, okay? Thank you. The, the hands went up really quickly, okay? So I know God's Spirit is working here, okay? Like He just boobs, went up there, right? And when we lack patience, right? We, we want things done right away. I had this happen uh, to me in, uh, in India. I told uh, my wife this story and a few others. Uh, if you're in India, people are extremely impatient. I mean, they cut in line. I mean, constantly. And it becomes annoying. And I had a couple of instances where I didn't have much sleep, okay? And uh, uh, there was this long line. There's a, there a couple of European girls behind me, and then, like, there's this long line. And so... There's a guy that came up and thought he could just cut in front of these European girls and get in line. And I just fussed them out in Indian language. I mean, I was just like, whoa, I spoke in tongues. That was awesome. So, so I did that. And I kid you not, literally 30 seconds later, another guy tried to do the same thing. But I was in line. And man, I was irritated. I just lost my patience. Because I was going, man, I've been standing in line. And I deserve to be first. Right? And, but I want you to think about this. You know, whether it was right or wrong is irrelevant, but here's what I'm trying to tell you. That it's sometimes the same attitude that we have with people in our lives. We kind of give them a time limit. If you don't clean up your act by such and such time, I'm going to forsake you. When I look at Jesus dealing with his disciples, he is loving and patient with them as he is trying to grow them. Folks, when we look at people, we need to stop looking at them just as statistics or facts. We need to look at them from the perspective of God. These are souls. These are human beings who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. May I love them and be patient with them as they seek to grow in their walk with God. Jesus, in verse 6, he says to them, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But look at a couple of different things here. In the following statements... Jesus is going to use the words, I am, multiple times. He's stating that he alone is the source of the right way, the truth, and eternal life. The first thing Jesus says, he says this, he says, I am the way. Notice, he doesn't say that he is a way or one of many ways. It's very important for us to understand that as Christians, Jesus is not offering himself as an option among many other options and saying, pick one. <coughs> Jesus is standing there and saying, I am the only source, I am the only way to God, the only source of truth, the only source of eternal life. First thing Jesus says is, I am the way. Now if you're a Jewish person in Jesus' time, and Jesus uses the word day, you are very familiar with it, because everything in the Old Testament regarding obedience to God used this word, the word way. 
For instance, Psalm 8611, the psalmist says, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 32 and 33 says this, Therefore you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. They were familiar with the word way, and so Jesus is saying, I am the way, I am the only way to the Father. Now, if you think about it in this respect, think about the next thing that he says. If that wasn't shocking enough, Jesus says not only is he the way, that he's also the truth. What is significant about this? Just like God gave his perfect law to the Israelites, God was giving his son Jesus Christ as the perfect embodiment of and fulfillment of the law in the incarnation. I want to close with this point here, and I want to look at the aspect of life next week. But here's what I want us to think about. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth. We're going to look at the aspect of the life next week. So Jesus is telling us that he is the only way to the Father. We've looked at the fact that Jesus is the mediator between God and man, because he's the one who has gone into the Holy of Holies in heaven, and offered his uh, body as a sacrifice on our behalf, the veil has been torn, and so we have full access to God. So he is the only way to God, but then Jesus says that he is also the truth. Well, what does that mean? You know, when you have your children, and uh, they have uh, an altercation, and two or three come to you, and you're trying to figure out what's going on, what do you tell them? You say, somebody tell me the truth, right? Because they're fibbing all the time. You put them in different rooms and you interrogate them. That's what happens. They give you a different story. You're trying to find out what the truth is. Jesus is saying, I am the way and the truth. What is the implication of that in our world, in our society today? I want you to think about something. We live in a very pluralistic world. Now you may say, well, yeah, Dave, when I look at all the nations of the world and the different languages... Yeah, it's true, we do live in a pluralistic world. But folks, can I tell you that in America, it's very pluralistic. It is. Because on the surface level, we may say, you know what, there's still a lot of Christians in this country, there's a lot of churches. Just because there are churches that are standing on a foundation does not mean that the Word of God is being preached. Just because you have people that are adhering to cultural Christianity and going to church just because their grandparents and parents went does not mean that they're a born-again believer. To be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ means to be completely redeemed, to be repentant of one's sin, and to put your faith in God. All you have to do is turn your television on. You see protests across the country. You see people marching for different things and different value system, what it tells me is that even in America, we're living in the middle, we're engaged in a massive clash of world views, where people are saying, you can't judge me, you let me live how I want to live, don't push religion down my throat, no one cares about Christianity, Jesus is only one of many ways, and we see all of these things happening all around us. And yet the church is mandated to preach the gospel that says Jesus is the only way to heaven. Folks, can I tell you that just because you live in America does not mean that you're not going to be persecuted. Because it may not necessarily happen on a national level, but it may happen on a local level. It may happen with many relationships that you have. The answer for America is not better laws. The answer for America is not doing the Pledge of Allegiance or having the Ten Commandments put on a lawn, okay? The answer for America is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can know the Ten Commandments by heart, folks, but if you stand before God one day and you don't have the righteousness of Christ, you're in big trouble. And that is what we need to be focused on, is that in a pluralistic world that has all these different worldviews, where people want to do their own thing, God has placed His church right in the middle of hostile territory, and He's saying to the church, be the light that you are called to be. So if you are a Christian in this room, 
And you are someone who would say, yes, absolutely, I've trusted Christ as my Savior. He has redeemed me. I'm a born-again Christian. You have no choice whether or not you're going to share the gospel. Hear me out one more time. If you are a Christian sitting in this room, you don't have the option of saying, I'm going to share the gospel or not share the gospel. If you are going to be obedient to Christ, you better be sharing the gospel. Is it comfortable? No. Is it ever comfortable? It's some of the most awkward conversations you will ever have in your life. But can I trust the Spirit of God to do something that I am not able to do? Folks, we have to step back sometimes. Because what happens many times is we watch television, we see things in the newspaper, and we cringe. And what do we do? We say, those people, right? Be honest, that's what we say. Look at those people. Look at that party. Look at what they're doing, and we point the finger, and God is saying, you would be the same, was it not for the grace of God? Lord, I thank you that your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, lived the perfect life, gave himself on a cross, but he didn't stay in the ground, Lord, but he, he was resurrected. Lord, now he sits at the right hand of the Father as our mediator, always making intercession for us. Father, so I pray that our power would not be found in the things of this world because they will decay. They will lose value. But Lord, help us to be heaven-focused as we seek to grow more in our walk with you. Father, I pray now at this time that you would prepare our hearts as we partake of communion, Lord, where we are reminded what you did for us 2,000 years ago. And what you did 2,000 years ago is still applicable today. It is the same Savior, it is the same cross, it is the same blood that was shed, Lord, that is still the hope for all of humanity today. Lord, may you convict us, may you commission us as your children to go out and share this beautiful message of God's love to a lost and dying world. So, Father, as we prepare to take communion, Father, may we truly thank you for what you did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.